so you can view it again later. So I wanted to just very briefly um, offer an introduction to this series that the Stockbridge Library has been hosting. And it was the idea of Dr. Owen Lewis, who's with us this evening and is really our host. Um, and the series is on narrative medicine. This is the last reading in a series of five that we have hosted for Poetry Month. And um, Owen, I hope that you'll speak just a little bit about narrative medicine. And Owen will be in discussion tonight with Dr. Daniel Becker, who we are delighted to have joining us. Um, beyond being a poet, Dr. Becker is very accomplished. Um, his debut book of poetry was published in 2020. And he was a general internist and primary care physician at the University of Virginia Medical Center from 1985 to 2018. And uh, he began writing poems just to give to friends and loved ones. And then um, I think realized the therapeutic nature of writing poetry and sharing poetry. So I'm going to stop talking, turn the program over to Dr. Lewis and Dr. Becker. And I hope you all enjoy the program. If you have questions, during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat box. Well, thank you, Wendy, and welcome, Dan. You've been a regular for this month that has whizzed by last of the end of Poetry Month. Um, Kate Daniels opened the series, and we're delighted to have her back. Uh, her presentation was on recovery from addiction. Um, and I have to say, we're really honored Charles Wright to have you participating with this this evening. It's, it's really um, an honor for all of us. Um, so Dan, um, I, I want to um, read a blurb on the back of your book. This book, by the way, um, won the 2019 New Issues Poetry Prize. The judge was Jericho Brown and he says, Dr. Becker's second chance is harrowing in its examination of life and death, or more precisely, that space in between the two. This book then is about that time and space where we depend on the doctor or where the doctor tells us he's been too late. It's just us, but she's expecting Jesus, sweet Jesus. If poetry heals and we know it does, Becker brings all he knows about the science and the body to us through a language we need for survival. This is a debut, but its poet is already experienced in the power of remedy and restoration. That's an amazing encapsulation of, of this book. The other thing I want to say, reading this book, um, you know, this, this is a poetry that's steeped in the narrative tradition, and it reminds me very much of William Carlos Williams, our physician, poet, father, um, in, in his, his book, um, Doctor Stories. And, um, you know, his, his, his prose is very poetic, but in, in all of, of Dan's um, poems in this book, we hear wonderful stories. Now, you, Wendy, you asked me to say a little bit about um, narrative medicine. Um, you know, narrative medicine is the, the, the writing and reading about illness and healing, healers and patients, caregivers and patients. And it really fills, I think, a very necessary gap in this modern age where doctors are rushed through um, electronic intake forms and have to see patients every nine and a half minutes or whatever it is their clinics allot them. And there's less and less chance in training, especially my, my area has been especially the training now of medical students at Columbia University, um, where I think poetry is the best ear training a doctor can have 
for learning how to listen. And there's a wonderful poem on listening, what to look for when we're listening. Dan, I hope you read that. Um, and, and I think Dan's gonna tell us more about that, but, but in short, it's so vital not only to learn how to listen, but how to process and how to bring ourselves into the process. And one more thing, there's so much that I learn about these human conditions from my fellow poets that are not in the textbooks. And, and I think the topics we've had over this month, um, uh, recovery from addiction, loss from addiction, parenting an autistic child, the experiences um, throughout cancer. And now, Dan, you're gonna give the summary statements about all this tonight, but um, there's so much to learn from the poets that doctors really need to hear. So with that, Dan, I'll, I'll ask you an open-ended question to tell us something about your life as a physician, as a poet, how those two intermingle, how they feed one another. Well, I, I started writing stories and poems um, when I no longer was able to write grants and scientific papers because I became overwhelmed with patients, um, thanks to managed care, <laughs> when it arrived at the University of Virginia uh, in the mid 1990s. And, and really overnight, I had like 500 new patients. So my traditional academic career um, couldn't continue, but I, I had a writing habit and I got up every morning and I was supposed to be working on something and, um, you know, looking at data that I had collected or other people had collected and refining it. So I um, decided I would try to respond to um, my work in a different way. Um, and uh, after a couple of years of that, I was, I took a class with Charles Wright. So my first teacher is in the room with, in the Zoom room with us and uh, I've continued. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you feel, um, I mean, I know you're involved in teaching. Um, tell us a little bit about how you use poetry in teaching medical students, residents. Well, I, I you know, we happen to have a couple people listening today. Um, you know, who are interested in, in bringing narrative into sort of routine clinical practice where you, you, you need to know more than the vital signs and the med lists and the, you know, the, the, the problem lists. Um, uh, the patients appreciate it and I think it makes our work more interesting. And, and um, um, uh, Peggy Pluzogan, who I see sort of on the right hand of my screen um, and I, you know, did, did a paper um, and, and a little project that attempted to bring story um, in, in a very sort of determined way uh, to encourage residents to use it. Um, we, to, today I got a poem in the mail that Kate Daniels wrote that was the poem of the day. Um, and um, it reminded me of a project again that Peggy and I did on forgiveness. Um, and the poetics of forgiveness. So um, it, it, if you put this stuff sort of in, in a pot and let it steep and the flavors sort of get, get, get better and better, it, it seems to all run together and, and make sense. Um, Do you want to say a little bit more about that project? Um, the, uh, well, um, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to ask Peggy to talk. She's muted. But 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 it it had to do with medical error and how doctors came to terms with having made a mistake, and um, and it it was one of those topics that's really really hard to talk about to find the language that explains sort of the de deterioration of identity 
when when a doctor makes a mistake and and somebody suffers or dies um you can't it's hard to forgive yourself but more than that it, it's hard to be who you were the day before the mistake um and then when you look at that as a doctor then you look at poets trying to grapple with the same topic um and um, um it it I mean, I can send you the reference, but um, no, I, you know, I think it's so important because we sometimes think of the healing of poetry moving in the direction mm -hmm. of the patient, but it's also so healing to the healer, and especially in the kind of practice that so many um, caregivers are pushed into. There's so very little time to process the experiences that are foisted upon one. And, and so the question, how do you live with a mistake? How do you reconcile a mistake? Mm -hmm. or, or I mean, it could be, you know, a life-threatening mistake, or it could be just a gaffe, you know, a, a, a moment of insensitivity that, that kind of sticks in your craw and you just keep thinking about it. And, um, you know, I personally have found in working with colleagues, you know, we, we hear so much about burnout. And I think that the narrative medicine approach is the really the anti burnout that we take some moment to reflect and think we may not be able to change things, but especially close reading in group settings. The group setting I find so, so important that we take on multiple points of view and, and learn to live with multiple points of view and, and, and can assimilate you know, other ideas. Um, so I, I know you've worked with house staff as well, Dan, and, and um, I don't know if you wanna say a few more words about that. Um, well, I think some of this will come up a little more naturally in, in the poems that I'm going to share later on. Um, I, I, something that, you know, the, the, the great poet Shesla Malosh, if I pronounced his name wrong, I'm sorry, but um, he, he said the purpose of poetry is to remind ourselves how hard it, it is, how hard it is to be just one person. And I, I think that sort of the multiplicity of who you are at, at a moment in time with the patient and who the patient is, and then the families hovering in the background. Um, it, it just becomes both confounding and inspiring. Um, um, so let, let's move to your poet poetry. I want to, um, you know, I, I have reread your book in anticipation of this evening. And the wonderful thing about poetry is every time you open the book, something else grabs your attention. So I, I, I wanna highlight one poem and then I'll turn it over to you, Dan. And, and this, the, the poem, In the Office of the Balance Center Director. And I thought, wow, you know, here you could walk past, um, you know, it reminds me at, at, at Columbia in, 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 the, um, in the university, in the elevators, it says for problems, call the Office of Vertical Transportation. <laughs> well, I had never heard ele elevators referred to as vertical transportation. You know, and sometimes you see something, and I think this is so what poetry does. In the Office of the Balance Center direction, Director, well, I mean, you know, around the corner from audiology, but suddenly you have us thinking about hearing and balance. And gosh, wouldn't it be wonderful for this world if, 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 if we all, you know, checked in with the balance center director. Um, and, and I think you do that, you play with these bigger ideas, but you keep it really close to the vest. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful poem and I hope you read the whole thing, but then um, 
there's a magical moment at the end, um, the, the, the final stanza before the last line is, hearing and balance, two sides of one coin, depend on endolymph in motion to activate the auditory nerve. Vertigo can be loud as a tunnel or quiet as a cricket. And then almost as an uh, aside, a silver cricket, the patient explains. What a magical moment that is a silver cricket, the patient explains. Well, so, I, stole, I stole that line from a patient, um, but you're uh, allowed to steal. Um, yeah, 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 and you, you, you know, you put it in, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it's duly noted that this, this is a quote, but we can also hear those magical moments in our patients, you know, when we're listening with a poetic ear. Anyway, Dan, please read. Um, we're eager to hear these wonderful poems. What I'm gonna do next, I hope, is to put my poems on the screen. Uh, Wendy, or let's see what happens. Okay. Um, I'm gonna make it a little smaller. We can't see your screen yet. Okay. How about now? Yes. Okay. All yep. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there. You might want to make the poem itself full screen. So we can still see the um, the backdrop. I think maybe it's the green button. The little green circle makes the. I don't use an apple, so I'm not sure. Danny, grab the um, Word document green button and maximize it and see if that doesn't help. You're almost there. Click on the uh, word icon on the bottom of your screen and that'll bring it up. Take your time, we're all poets. <laughs> So go back to the ghost. See if you can get back to this poem. You might have to unshare and share again. Just try to find a word. Can yeah, you if, you, if you roll down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see it. Yeah, okay. Now just hit that green button right there. Right there. That one. That one. Right there. But now I'm muted. I'm, I'm oh, muted. what now? Let's just see. No, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah. But you're going right. to have to share again, I think. Yeah. 
Can you do that on share and share link? Because I want you to do. Great. Okay. Is this big enough? I think that's perfect. Okay, thank you. Consult. Now this is this doesn't look like a poem. This is a prose poem. A minute after the tube is out, she turns blue and stops moving. Half a minute later, she loses her pulse. I learned as a student to feel the difference between the pulse in my fingers and the pulse at the patient's wrist, or thought I learned. When you listen for a heart to stop, you start to hear heart sounds that might not be there, like waking up at night thinking you heard something, then listening to the dark to be sure, not quite convinced either way. Weak sounds, S1 and S2, vowels closing, slow and slower, regular then irregular, then almost nothing. The monitor is off in her room, but on at the nursing station. One screen shows every heart in the unit. I don't want to sign the consult note, note until the line stays flat. Erratic electrical activity went on for a few minutes is an understatement. She'd be gone for most of the screen then come back for a complex or two then go away again. I watched the blip travel left to right then arrive at the edge of the screen then turn a corner out of sight and get lost until out of nowhere it finds itself and comes back from the other side. Several nurses stop what they're doing to watch too. Finally, I discharge her from the monitor. Um, so here's another listening poem. Um, um, after I retired and July 2018, I audited a class in the, the music department at UVA, um, and it was called Deep Listening 101. Among the deep listeners in Deep Listening 101 are music majors taking the class for credit, and an auditor on Social Security who can only hum one note, and that's the note he hums. Overtones find a major chord. Then we march off and find a place to sit and list the sounds while building castles out of sound. Listening is the hardest thing a brain does, according to listening psychologists soliciting grants and donations. It is now possible to follow sound into the brain and map its journey up the brain stem and into the attic. Some sounds turn on all the lights, other sounds turn them off. In one creation myth, human ears fly like bats from one echo to another. The bats returning to our attic don't trigger the motion detectors in our driveway. It takes poetic license to claim that motion detectors listen, unless the motion detector is a sleeping dog who wakes up to announce the UPS truck in the driveway. I look, look around, listen up. There are worlds beyond our thresholds. During the field trip inside the sound-free chamber, those strangers pounding at the door, heartbeats. Home visit. I first read this poem in Charles Wright's class. We follow a blue Ford tractor pulling a wagon and moving slowly scattering straw like exhaust, South Side Virginia in July, still haying season. So hot the haze shimmies on the asphalt. June bugs strafe the windshield, the afternoon breeze a warm sponge. The nurse is the guide telling me how to greet other drivers, lift two fingers from the steering wheel, only two, show some restraint, where to park, Watch out for the dog stretching a yawn, scored ribs settling on a minor cord. Who's who as we edge through the home, front porch to back, generations ungapped. No work, no school, no AC. Fans were, TV promises, a better life. We reach the kitchen and in the pantry, an old woman with electric hair 
in petrified eyes hums a gospel. She looks straight through us. She's expecting Jesus, sweet Jesus. Um, the Best Storyteller Award, and in fact, there is a Best Te Storyteller Award, and it was awarded to me at a clinic retreat um, a few years ago. Um, at the clinic retreat, everyone gets a prize, and the Best Storyteller reminds us of those times a man goes on a journey. But this man is Dr. William Osler, the doctor's doctor, the professor's professor. And he's crossing the Delaware to Camden where Walt Whitman, the great American poet, the poet's poet, endures fame and poor health. Every case is supposed to be interesting, but Whitman, according to Osler, suffered only from what his age could explain, plus or minus the usual wear and tear, the side effects and worries, the incidentals that let doctors hedge their bets. Chance then as now regressed to the mean a stroke, then as now, was what it is. Tuberculosis, then as now, was in the air. Whitman died from or with tuberculosis. Osler lived with prosector's warts from more than one of the hundreds of TB-ridden autopsies his curiosity insisted on. When Whitman says the poet drags the dead out of their coffins and stands them on their feet, the story then wants to see them walk. And in a tale about a man who crosses a river, listeners feel the breeze and the motion while doctors recall that case of disembarkation vertigo and how easy it is for life to be uneasy. Osler between two shores puzzles over Whitman's leaves of grass. Whitman between revisions puzzles over leaves of grass. The housekeeper's cat can't resist the poet's great laugh. The ferry fights the current. At least one pas passenger is queasy while the story moves to the next generations of doctors and poets. When Dr. William Carlos Williams lived in Philadelphia, he studied Osler and Whitman and where to draw the line between uncertainty and mystery and how to make a line of poetry speak for everyone while the poet learns a living as a doctor. In the story of the stranger coming to clinic, our new patients will wait months for 40 minutes. That's kind of the doctor's lament, how to squeeze somebody in. So Owen mentioned this poem. This is sort of two poems in a row that feature disembarkation vertigo. In the office of the Balance Center director, around the corner from audiology, on a desk near a model of the inner ear, a dozen paperweights are waiting. The director picks one up to make it snow and illustrate how the brain knows where the head is heading. From the desktop of her laptop, she double clicks a film clip of two eyes gazing to the left and ticking like a watch, clockwise when sitting, counterclockwise when supine since disembarking from a cruise across an ocean. Eyes adjust to lost horizons, but first they need to wander. Her finger tracks the voyage of the otoliths, calcite crystals, bone and stone that aren't supposed to float, but on occasion do. On a related subject, the third auditory ossicle in the deep end of the middle ear is as small as in God on a dime if you've ever read a dime. Hearing and balance, two sides of one coin, depend on end and lift and motion to activate, activate the auditory nerve. Vertigo can be as loud as a tunnel or quiet as a cricket, a silver cricket, the patient explains. So I've been thinking a lot about vaccinations lately. This is my first vaccination poem before flu season. It's a bunionette, not a bunion, not a rock or shell or glass bead wedged between the base of the fifth toe and the inside of her slipper. A sharp little knife, a number 10 blade, pairs away the keratin. 
with her heel in the palm of my hand, we talk about callous and the glory days of soft skin and cotillions that defied gravity. I tell her the story of the little mouse who went to visit his mother and on the way wore out two sets of wheels, a pair of shoes, both feet. What nice new feet you have, his mother says, his mother will. The patient doesn't get it. It's one of those stories where you had to be there. One of those stories where money buys anything and then a happy live ending. Flecks of dead skin fly off. The big pieces click on the tile as we whittle away our time together. We move from convex to concave, from literal to rhetorical. What's the difference between a whole and half a whole? Is fluvac safe as well as effective? This is easy. This is fun. This is maybe a little weird. I remember my mother's feet. It is a little weird. After life and in between, a child has died but is brought back and remembers floating near the ceiling, looking down at the doctor who is now on the air, sharing the protogos point of view with the radio audience, except it's called a near death. The defibrillator didn't want to work. The music of spheres whistled like a train. The proverbial tunnel of light was actually a noodle. There were clouds too, and baby clouds. Everyone was nice, especially God. The doctor chuckles and recalls a couple hundred kids under ice or in the river long enough to be blue, stiff, flatline gone ready at last to receive all benefit of doubt. In the car at 50 miles per hour and late again for your morning, you hope when the time comes, you can drown first, then reappear beneath those generous hands. That first breath would taste like lightning. This is not a drill. At work, there are three kinds of drills, fire, earthquake, shooter. During a fire drill, the building empties into the parking lot where crowds kill time and blame the fire marshal. The smokers want to smoke, but don't. The doctor talks to the 240 patient and tries to stay on schedule. If communication is the heart of medicine, diligence is its habit. Then he looks for the three o'clock patient. In a fifth floor office, the photograph of a storm tossed schooner is 10 degrees off plumb because that wasn't a drill, nor was it a backhoe unburying the storm, storm drain it buried last month. The wall shook while everyone wandered around looking for direction. The director said, this isn't my fault. Then the world returned to normal. As instructed, People keep quiet during the shooter drill. They stare at the floor. They don't share funny looks. Not only is it bad luck to reveal where you'd hide, it's unthinkable. But if you look out the window and take a fire escape moment to consider all your options, you have to admit the inescapable fact of existence. There's no corner small enough, no air thin enough to disappear in. Upstairs, when housekeeping straightens the photograph, the director restores its commemorative tilt. The photographer spoke seven languages and in a Tower of Babel accent recalled the wars he escaped and the evil he didn't. Meanwhile, that ship is beached, that sky is gray, that tide is lost, that, that storm is spent, those sails are torn and empty. The poet's recurrent dream is a sailboat that floats on air and travels in time. He tacks back and forth over the old neighborhood where old friends are still young. They look up, smile, wave hello, goodbye, see you later. He'd wave back, but one hand for the tiller, one hand for the sheet. Even in a dream, it's easy to spill the wind. Even in a dream, it takes practice. 
Here's another nautical poem, bulkheads. There are dozens of ways to 360. It's mostly in the hips, he promises. We never know when the ocean might surprise us. What if an arm or two gets tangled up in harpoon line? What if suddenly it's time to paddle upside down? My leukemic friend and kayak mentor is counting on remission a year or more, including time to teach me how to roll like an Inuit. Because of him, I've added bulkheads fore and aft, watertight, silicone, co silicon caulk, and lots of it. He wants to. He wants us to go out and play in the surf, capsize for fun, for adventure, for the sense of revival. He can spin like a dolphin, float like a cork, regulate his angular momentum. He knows when to get nowhere fast and how, on a whim, to return to where he started. There's no reason not to trust him. In memoriam, we shuffle into place and grieve in stanzas. The acoustics cling like lint and everything, family man, scholar, citizen, soldier, sounds fuzzy and unraveled. I read the hymns on my neighbor's lips. I count the panes of stained glass. The windows are too kind, saints and post beatitude poses as if their share of suffering is over, blame place, since forgotten, and all they have to do now is exemplify faith and endurance, the way models and catalogs smile at the sea and stay young. The sky is too blue, robes too soft, martyrdom too therapeutic. I explore my dark suit's pockets, a prescription pad, a photo ID, a list of people who expect to call, a list of errands, birdseed, fertilizer, a list of wards and numbered diagnoses. Afterwards, there's a reception up the hill, but I am chiming like a clock and rush off after letting the survivors, one at a time, thank me for everything. Swimming with John's ghost. This poem uh, references a time when the uh, UVA swimming pools were open. So this is uh, before COVID. Um, and most of this is true. Swimming with John's ghost. During the service, after the mensch acclamation and before the sermon sized metaphor that started with a tree then lost me, a comrade from the morning shift at college they shared a lecture hall and the appreciation that all sleepy students are each sleepy in different ways. Quoted John bragging about having the North Grounds pool all to himself at sunrise. Morning people brag about their mornings. This morning, the lifeguards, proving they do pay attention to the lives they guard, had the music turned to oldies. Sam Cook crooning, you ooh, 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 send me as Sam's fans adjust their goggles. John, easy to spot in that deep blue bathing cap he claims helps part the waters, takes the lane next to me. We're standing there praying the water isn't as cold as it is and waiting for one of us to acknowledge our existence. Bummer about that service, I say, hoping not to sound too relieved he doesn't want to share my lane. Total, he says, then we submerge. Strange how dying helped his stroke. He doesn't have to breathe, but does. Old habits die hard. I'm a little choked up in the locker room and he suggests doing something about that cough. He would know. Since it is a locker room, I share some locker room wisdom. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. John takes his cue. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. We allow a moment of silence, but before any hymns erupt, I share my favorite hymn fact. Emily Dickinson poems can be sung to the tune of Amazing Grace. I dwell in possibility, he sings almost on key, then asks if he can borrow my brush. Get real, I answered. Who wants to catch someone else's static? 
We complain about chlorine and dry itchy skin. We put our pants on one leg at a time, an act of faith that grounds us. See you later, he promises, and just like anyone, walks out the door. Um, so what, one of the things, um, I'm no longer, I'm just talking now, I'm not reading a poem, but one of the themes that's come up on these Thursday evenings in April um, is, what does it mean when a poet writes about family or friends or, or patients? And um, is, is there a boundary? Or do, do, do you cross the line when you do that? And how do you do that in a way that is, um, that respects the occasion that inspired you? Um, well, that I actually had a recent email exchange with um, John's wife, um, who really likes this poem. She, she said he wasn't a morning person, in fact. Um, so I, the, the person who gave the elegy got that wrong. Um, but she said that, that, that John would have enjoyed this poem and for her this poem brought him back to life for a moment. Um, so th there's no higher praise uh, to hear something like that. So th this, this is, um, here's a poem about teaching medical students. Um, and this is the last poem that I plan to read. Um, we can talk afterwards. Um, a short explanation of everything. Our patient says she's burning up, burning up. We sponge her off. The student is learning how blood boils, how shaking chills and drenching sweats punctuate fever, how nerves talk, how nerves listen how some circuits turn all the lights on and all the lights off, how hearts beat one cell at a time while squeezing together and in sequence, how the life of the mind is beyond understanding in the same way that a kidney will never understand the flow of urine, why a sigh is more than a deep breath, how sleep is not as simple as it looks. During general anesthesia, the OR enjoys music. The surgeon whistles as she sews. The patient will wonder where that tune came, tune came from, Broadway most likely. Between all we know and remember and forget and forget we forgot or sometimes just sleep through. Beyond the day-to-day -day cogitation that adds or subtracts or instructs or contradicts, that looks for proof, that accounts for chance, that powers leaps of faith and plans escape routes, that registers to vote and then votes. There is a fine line, a user interface, a membrane. And what is a membrane if not for its pores? With each generation, the explanation gets thinner and thinner. Ion channels let the insides know the outsides. We're two thirds water. Take us to the river and we'll displace our weight in water floating this way or that, the current explains which direction. Thank you. Dan, thank you. Um, wow, the, these, each one of these poems is a real treat. Um, and the, and the way I think about poetry, and I know you think about poetry, it's the beginning of a conversation. And so any, anybody want to comment? Anybody want to add to the conversation? Um, so many wonderful directions we could take, take the conversation. But um, let's hear from our listeners, if anyone wants to. I'd like to say something. I, I'm Holly Wright, and I was sitting across from Charles, who had the screen in front of him. And uh, it was beautiful to watch, and it was beautiful to hear your poems, Dan. They're wonderful poems. It was, it was the nicest digital experience I've ever had, uh, watching Charles, listening to you. Bye. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Charles. Um, 
I second that emotion. <laughs> I'll just say that, um, thank you, Danny. This was, that was a wonderful reading and uh, the discussion before was great. Um, I came to this, I wasn't sure I could get here tonight because I had my final class. I'm, I'm in Nashville, I teach at Vanderbilt University. Today is our last day of classes, thank God. What an incredibly difficult, challenging semester it's been for everyone. But I was teaching a class of advanced undergraduate undergraduates this semester, plus a few graduate students in life writing. And um, one of the things that became apparent really early in this class that was that students were writing about incredible traumas that had that they had been their experience in their lives and they were striving in the midst of a sort of global trauma to write about this. So I came to this reading um, happily because Danny is my friend and my fellow poet and um, I wanted to be here if I could, but also with some trepidation because I was full of emotion after having said goodbye to this class, which was really quite extraordinary. And one of the things that struck me in putting these two experiences right up, being forced to put these two experiences right up next to each other, is how valuable is the discursive element of your poems. Um, I'm, I'm really excited by a lot of what's going on in contemporary American poetry right now by younger American poets, but it doesn't always have to do with discursiveness and a willingness to sort of drop deep down into what the subject of the poem is. So I, I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for sure. it. I'm, it's it's so moving to me, um, the way that you're able to do that and the way that you do it. And sometimes even a, you, you, you're you able to sort of engage very deep subjects, um, not only in a deep and respectful way, but also sometimes in a lighthearted way. I found myself laughing, you know, at a, at a lot of the asides that you put in your poems. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Wonderful poems. Well, no. Kate, to, um, to second what you just said, the discursiveness kind of gives us time and space to think through these things and, and to assimilate some of these things and to allow reactions to come to the fore. You know, when we condense, 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 I mean, we sometimes get, you know, lightning moments, but we don't always get that kind of reflection that I think Dan's poetry induces. I'd also like to say, Danny, this was absolutely wonderful. Um, and I, uh, I teach um, um, health humanities at, at UVA and, and happily worked with Danny as a colleague um, for many, many years. But I wanted to mention that just recently in a course that our center offers for graduating medical students, um, most of them didn't know Danny um, or, or didn't get to work closely with him. Um, but we used one of, one of your poems, the guidelines from the Joint National Commission, which is, which is lengthy and which in a sense opens a door to the inside of the doctor's head or of this particular doctor's head. And the students were just enraptured with it. Um, it started a really rich and um, random conversation in this group of almost 20 students who are, um, you know, obviously excited about finishing, finishing medical school, nervous about residency, wondering if they're ever going to get the hang of clinical work and, and eavesdropping with this poem on um, sort of inside, inside Danny's mind. Um, again, with some serious points, but also this marvelous wry take on things. Um, and so it, it was just, it was enormous fun to be there and watch them respond to your wonderful work. Well, um, yeah, inside my mind, there's a line in that poem that refers to looking in one ear and out the other. Um, so that's kind of what my mind is like uh, some days. But I, I think that, that that, yeah, for me, the story is everything, and and I and there needs to be a, a speaker in the poem, and the speaker needs to be moving somewhere, 
you know, starting at point A and ending up in, at point B. And that's, um, and there are lots of pivots. And sometimes, you know, if you take the poem apart and look at what's going on, it, it, it may be a word choice. It, it may be, um, you know, just the resonance of certain vowel or consonant sounds. Um, um, every once in a while, I actually have a strict iambic pentameter line or throw in some rhymes again. Um, and, and I think what's going on is sort of the, my, the, the, the speaker's attitude toward the subject of the poem, which, which is something called tone. Um, I, I try to make that complicated and mixed and, and therefore more interesting. I mean, that's a little technical stuff, but yeah, I, 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 it's not fun for me to write if there's not a story that I'm trying to share. But what, what strikes me, Danny, um, is that uh, you do that, you're a great storyteller, but at the same time, you exemplify that quote from uh, Czeslaw Milos that you um, started with, where the, and, and then there, I, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get the uh, line right, but it's something about what are membranes if not pores or, you know, for pores or something. What, what's the exact line, Danny? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, I'd have to pick up. Okay, the well, anyway, but, but that idea, like you're, so you're this great storyteller, but you're, um, you're not, uh, authoritarian that is you're not you keep like they're, they're keeping these openings where other things rush in and there's this um, <clears throat> broken boundary between you and the world which I feel like um, I, so I'm Matt Goodman's brother and I feel like I've understood through some of your poems over the years and especially tonight how that uh, ability is related to being a good doctor um, and I just really appreciated seeing your profession as a profession of opening the boundary between you and other people. Yeah, I, I, thanks for coming, Jeff. And, 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 and I, I think Matt and Jeff have been my earliest readers. I mean, I, I've, I've been very shy about sharing this stuff, um, but, but you know, I, I've known Matt since he was a resident and somehow we figured out that we enjoy. I think he once sent me a poem that you sent him and I realized, oh, we can have poetry side conversations and we've been doing that for, for decades now. Um, um, someone had said earlier um, something about letting, letting us inside the doctor's mind. And you know that um, in the poem that ends, um, it was weird, I remember my mother's feet um, I thought that is so wonderful. I mean, I, I'm never going to look at feet in the same way, but, you know, here, you know, you're examining or the, the speaker is examining and then, wow, this, you know, almost from left field, remembering your mother's feet. And what are you supposed to do with that? You know, I mean, you know, except you take the occasion to write it down. And even though you think it's a little weird, you're thinking about it, you give us a chance to think about those weird things that sometimes fly into our heads. And you know, the, 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 the cost of pushing them out of our heads, again, coming back to something earlier, is just like detachment and burnout, you know? But um, you know, around those kind of associations, you know, the world opens up. So that that was a wonderful, wonderful ending. Well, that that the the book reference in that poem is called Mouse Tales by Arnold Lobel, and um, I highly recommend it. I read it to my kids, and I I give it to when my residents have children, and you know I start giving them kids books. And so Arnold, you know, Frog and Toad, another good characters from Arnold Lobel. Wendy, do you stock those books in the library. Good. And let, let me add, um, Dan's book has been um, generously donated by Dan to the Stockbridge Library and all the readers on this series um, 
their books are now in the Stockbridge Library. And I think, Wendy, we're building up quite a poetry section, aren't we? We are indeed. Um, but it's not true that all of them are at the library because many of them migrate to my house until their due date, and then they go back to the library. Okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank my colleagues in general medicine for um, being here tonight and supporting me and uh, encouraging me. And um, that's one of the reasons why after I retired in July, 2018, I'm still working at, at UVA and uh, um, I'd like to dedicate the short explanation of everything to the Foundations of Clinical Medicine course that uh, goes through the four years of medical school and, and Peggy uh, has put together. I, I, I was thinking of Foundations of Clinical Medicine when I uh, wanted to explain everything on one page. And that's where I got my start in teaching narrative medicine through the equivalent course at Columbia. I was just going to say briefly, I got to share an office with Danny for many years. So even before he was uh, actively writing and sharing poems, I got to hear just hundreds of prose poems of Danny's dictations that, you know, included the dog history and, um, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, visits to uh, people's houses and, and hear Danny talk to, uh, widows and, and newly orphaned people. And so um, the inspiration to a lot of those stories uh, um, that, that find their way into the poems, I got to hear the, some of the raw material. Thank you, Danny, it was great. I, I uh, kind of laughing and crying at the same time listening, thanks. Oh, gosh. I just wanted to say um, the same thing that Danny has been a mentor of mine since I've come to UVA and working with him on tons of different projects. My, my experience of Danny is basically capturized, capitalized in, in, in saying, you know, I would try and say something and then Danny would say it and I would like be what he said because he was able somehow to express things that I couldn't express in this language that captured everything that I was trying to say. And I think that was true about our research together, that there were things that just couldn't be said in the usual context of a, you know, of a research report. And somehow Danny was able to capture what really needed to be said uh, in a way that was um, so much more uh, uh, rounded and, 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 and true, frankly, true. Um, and I think somehow, what we've been able to incorporate in the foundations course because of Danny about the use of story and how, um, you know, the first time you meet a new patient, we teach a student to say, tell me your story. Um, that's Danny. And there are hundreds of medical students ha that have been trained that that's how they meet a new patient is tell me your story. I just actually gave a presentation today to the, to the health system about the use of story and everything I said was basically Danny Becker. Um, <laughs> now being said to nurse managers and CEOs and you know people who are engaging with patients every day, um, that was Danny. And I was I am so grateful that I have been able to be touched by him. Well, and I'll just add as your husband. No, oh. <laughs> as a practicing physician oh. in the mashup of a pandemic and poetry that we really should allow a little space between poems for tears. Oh. Danny, we love you. And laughter. And we love your language. And we hear your, your voice in your poems and it, it's deeply meaningful. Well, thank you. This is where we should run out of time. I'm feeling embarrassed, uh, Owen. Um, well, I think, I think we have. The timing is perfect. So this concludes our month of poetry and narrative medicine. Danny, can't thank you enough. This was such a memorable presentation. Kate, thank you for coming back and for launching the series. And of course, 
Wendy for, for fostering the kind of programming in our little town of Stockbridge that allows for so much to happen. Thank you, thank you. And thank you to you, Owen, for making this happen. And Danny, thank you so much for your reading and all of you for your really meaningful context around who Dan is in the world and the impact that he has. Um, it's just been amazing. Thanks to all of you. Um, if you want to look back at this, stockbridgelibrary.org has a YouTube channel. Recording will be posted. Thank you all so very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>